Welcome back to the Virtual Medical Educators Forum. My name is Catherine Napier. I've just recently completed my specialist training in endocrinology and diabetes and general medicine. During my training, I spent three years in research and this predominantly focused on autoimmune Addison's disease. And that's why today I'm going to talk about how to approach PACES Station 5 if you encounter a patient with Addison's disease. And then in the second half of the session, I'll cover the management of acute adrenal insufficiency. So first of all, PACES Station 5. It's an integrated clinical assessment station in which you'll take a brief focused history followed by a short examination. Or you can do these two things in a more integrated fashion in the station. You'll be expected to do some explaining to the patient and then the examiners will have a couple of minutes to follow up with some questions. So I'll talk about what questions I would ask if I suspected the patient had a diagnosis of Addison's disease and then I'll talk about what I would look for on examination and then how I would approach any questions that the examiners have. So when it comes to taking a history from a patient with Addison's disease, I tend to think about this in terms of the symptoms and signs of glucocorticoid deficiency and then the symptoms and signs of mineralocorticoid deficiency. So if we take glucocorticoid deficient symptoms and signs first of all, it's important to ask the patient, of course, in general how they've been feeling. But it's key to really ask them about any weight loss, to ask them about their appetite, to ask them about any nausea or any vomiting, and then to move on to find out a bit about their energy levels. Have they been feeling fatigued? How do they feel when they wake up in the morning? And do they feel the need to go to bed early? It's also important to find out if their symptoms have prevented them from working or from studying at college or in education. You can then move on to think about mineralocorticoid symptoms and signs. You can ask the patient if they have been craving any particular type of food and what we're interested in here is any craving for salty food. You can ask about postural symptoms such as lightheadedness or dizziness and that will give a good clue as to whether or not there is any mineral corticoid deficiency. Once you've addressed both of those things, you can try and find out how long the patient has had these symptoms for. Addison's disease is insidious in onset and patients may well have had symptoms for several months or even several years. Some may only recall these in recent weeks, but it's, it's really important to try and delineate how long the symptoms have been bothering the patient. Another key point is to ask about personal and family history of autoimmune conditions. Addison's disease, in common with other endocrine conditions, is more common in women. So that's, they're the key features really I would look at in terms of taking a history if you suspect that this is the diagnosis in station five. In terms of the examination, of course, you want to do a general inspection of the patient, but it's really important that you make it clear that you're looking for the hallmark feature of hyperpigmentation. You can ask the patient as well during the history taking whether or not they've noticed any change in their skin color or if they look tanned, have they been on holiday recently? When you're looking for this on examination, the good places to look are palm creases and also the buccal mucosa. You can also look for areas of increased friction, at in areas of increased friction, for example, the knuckles and the hands. A key part of the examination in these patients is also checking the postural blood pressure. It may not be practical to do a lying and standing blood pressure in station five, but you should say that this is what you would like to do. So once you've performed your history and examination, you may then be asked to discuss with the patient how you would make the diagnosis or what treatment that you might recommend for them. Or it may be the case that you will discuss with them any concerns they have about what might be going on. And then the examiners will take over and ask about investigations, diagnosis and treatment. In terms of investigations, I would say to make the diagnosis of Addison's disease, you want to perform a short synactin test with an ACTH level. What you're expecting to see is a subnormal response to synactin on the short synactin test and an elevated adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH level. 
It's also very useful to get a sample for electrolytes and what you would expect to see here, although it doesn't always happen, is hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. A measurement of renin and aldosterone can also be useful to assess ruminal corticoid deficiency. In terms of the cause of Addison's disease, in this country, in the UK, 90% of cases are autoimmune in origin. As I've mentioned, it's much more common in women. And the way to confirm that it's autoimmune in origin is to measure 21-hydroxylase antibodies. 21-hydroxylase is a steroidogenic enzyme in the adrenal gland. And these antibodies are positive in the majority of, of patients with autoimmune Addison's disease. Elsewhere in the world, infective causes, particularly TB, is much more common. And of course, you can use your surgical sieve or whatever other method you have for your other PACES stations to talk about other rarer causes. Metastatic infiltration of the adrenal glands, for example, would be another rare cause. So I hope that's been a useful overview of the symptoms and signs to talk about and look for in a patient with Addison's disease. And then a little bit of information about how you might confirm the diagnosis um, and what the differentials might be. Addison's disease is rare. There are around 200 people newly diagnosed in the UK each year, but because of its hallmark features, particularly of hyperpigmentation and salt craving, it fits really nicely into station five, along with other endocrine disorders. Thyroid disorders are much commoner and, and they pop up quite frequently in station five too. If you're asked to talk about potential treatment, you won't be expected to know about this in a lot of detail, but of course these patients require glucocorticoid replacement and mineralocorticoid replacement. In the UK, hydrocortisone is the mainstay of glucocorticoid replacement. Patients take a daily dose, total daily dose of between 15 and 25 milligrams, for example, usually in two or three divided doses. The largest dose after waking and then a smaller dose around lunchtime or perhaps late afternoon. Some patients take these three doses every day. Mineral corticoid replacement is done with fluidrocortisone and that's just one standard dose per day, for example, 100 micrograms. So that's my overview of how to approach Addison's disease in station five. For the second half of this session, I'm going to move on to talk about the management of acute adrenal insufficiency. Acute adrenal insufficiency is something that we might not encounter every day, but it's absolutely paramount for patient safety that we know how to manage this. Adrenal crises are still life-threatening and our patients, although we try our very best to educate them about seeking treatment and help early, they still need to be able to rely on the frontline staff when they attend hospital with adrenal cortical insufficiency. So the, one of the most important points to make here is that you should not ever delay treatment to confirm the diagnosis. You may know that the patient has Addison's disease or is steroid dependent or takes long-term steroids, but if not, but you suspect that this is the underlying diagnosis, please just go ahead and start treatment and think about confirming the diagnosis at a later stage. The mainstay of any adrenal crisis is parenteral hydrocortisone and an intravenous bolus of fluid resuscitation with saline. So hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams given IV or IM and 0.9% saline given rapidly is what to do. And then you buy yourself a little bit of time and the patient is safe and you can then plan what to do next. If the patient has required parenteral steroids, it's likely they're unwell. They may, for example, be vomiting, they may be hypotensive, they may have had a collapse, or they may be very unwell indeed. And in any of these scenarios, you should include, we should plan to continue with parenteral steroids over the next day or two until the clinical condition stabilizes. There are two ways to do this. You can continue with parenteral steroids six hourly, or you could use a continuous infusion. But in clinical practice, we usually tend to do IV or IM four times a day or six hourly, and we would usually use hydrocortisone 50 milligrams for each dose, although 100 milligrams can be used too. You should continue the intravenous saline while the patient is unwell. 
In terms of when to switch back to oral steroid replacement, the patient needs to be eating and drinking and no longer vomiting, and their clinical condition, of course, needs to have stabilised. Once the patient is well, you can switch them back to their normal hydrocortisone. This should be double the normal steroid dose that they take because they will still be recovering from their illness. In terms of fluid recortisone, there is no need for dose adjustment during acute illness, so you can just continue their standard dose. If the patient has been on parenteral steroids or double dose steroids for just a few days, which is likely to be the case, there's no need to taper back down once they're well. We normally advise patients that once they're feeling back to normal, they should drop down to their usual hydrocortisone 24 or 48 hours later, and the fluid recortisone will have continued throughout. If you would like any further guidance on what to do in terms of managing steroids in the acute setting, for example, if your patient is undergoing endoscopy or having a dental extraction or a surgical procedure, the UK Addison's Disease Self-Help Group has some really useful downloadable, freely accessible guidelines on what to do with steroids during any of these procedures. If you'd like further information on the diagnosis and management of autoimmune Addison's disease, JCEM, or the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, published extensive guidelines back in 2016. These guidelines have a lot of information about autoimmune Addison's disease and some more tips about what to look for in the history and what to do when you're making the diagnosis and what to do when you're starting treatment in these patients. I hope that's been useful and good luck to anyone undertaking PACES soon.